And, uh, you know, I'm, I was asked by Alex to speak briefly uh, about uh, what a com what the Commonwealth of Learning is, uh, of which I'm a staff member. And I also tr use that opportunity to bring a slightly different perspective, a perspective that comes primarily from the developing countries of the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, I, a large part of this I wrote with a lot of advice from my colleague Asha Kanwar, who's the president of uh, the Commonwealth of Learning. You know, uh, historically we were founded by the prime ministers of the Commonwealth countries when they met in 1987. They met last time in 2015 here in this very place in Malta. So when they met in 1987, uh, the a number of prime ministers thought that uh, they were looking at the success of the British Open University which allowed people uh, without restrictions to move into the degree stream. And they also wanted more internationalization of that experience, and they all proposed that we should have an organization. So Canada came forward and British Columbia came forward to host it in Vancouver, which is why this is the only Commonwealth agency located outside London. Uh, now, wh what do we do? Our idea, we, our main aim is to use existing as well as new technologies. So there's always a bias towards technology, existing as well as new technologies to improve and expand access to learning. Uh, today we call it learning for sustainable development, but the aim was always to increase access to learning in, in a way that's highly affordable. And today we are completely centered around goal four. I mean, you know, the Sustainable Development Goal 4, which, which talks about inclusive and equitable uh, quality education, uh, which is also one area that UNESCO and DAS converge very closely, although UNESCO works on many more SDGs. And a lot of our work, including the work on open educational resources and the way we relate to the Congress, is also based on Goal 4. Now, therefore, we promote learning for sustainable development, we promote innovations in uh, affordable and accessible technologies. And very broadly speaking, we serve the last person in the queue, so to speak, or in the line, so to speak, if I used a North American term. And there are three dimensions to our work. One is economic growth, and uh, social inclusion is next, and then uh, environmental conservation. Economic growth, you know, we deeply link learning with economic growth. I mean, you know, it's taken as a given. It might not look very visible in a context where we are today. We are talking of the experience in Europe where this is either taken for granted or it's not to be discussed in forums like this. But our idea is in, in developing countries, there is often a necessity to justify continued investments in education, secondary and higher education. And we have done a lot of work, like with uh, people like this, the peasant women, the women that you see here, who are all mostly shepherds, to show that a dollar, every dollar invested in learning with, uh, uh, with workers like this resulted in additional income, and uh, the increase amounted to almost $9 more. So it was a huge increase we were able to show. And uh, there are lots of livelihoods for indigenous communities we were able to demonstrate. Uh, that they could be created on the ground. And you can see people here, the Batwa community in, 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 in a part of Uganda that's normally not easily accessible. And we also were able to show that technical training relate, uh, led to significant increase in income in countries like Kenya. This may look self-evident in places such as Europe. The other important area we are uh, very deeply involved in is social inclusion because Commonwealth as a whole, especially countries such as Canada and Australia, invest very heavily in this area of promoting girls' education because many of them are also facing early marriage. So to avoid early marriage as well as to put them in education, uh, Canada and Australia are investing very heavily, so followed by United Kingdom. And we work in several countries on very specific projects. Here is a project in Bangladesh that you are able to see. And we've also been involved in open schooling concept, taking the concept of open university down to secondary schools. The open schooling is a major idea that uh, we have been able to promote in many Commonwealth countries. And after almost 20 years of activity in this area, we are able to show that, again, social return on investment through open schooling is very high in countries, many countries, uh, small states, like uh, such as uh, Belize here. And uh, we have been offering very slowly uh, in terms of environmental conservation. We, we, we have not been very active in this area. We are coming into this area. 
we have been cre we have created a diploma on sustainable agriculture that's accepted by several universities and samoa has been a very active partner in this and we have also been promoting uh, training of the green teachers this is an area where again after a gap of almost 10 years we find that a lot of interest is re emerging and now we are also investing very considerably in the area of open educational resources back in 2012 we, were, we collaborated with UNESCO to organize the first World Open Educational Resources Congress. I think some of you were there. And at that point in time, you know, people from different parts of the world, especially Europe and North America, met people from developing world and understood that the whole consideration in developing world was more about access and less about openness. They said, if I don't even access the resource, I'm not worried about its license. So now, uh, big changes have happened, and uh, very soon Slovenia and UNESCO will organize the second World OER Congress, and uh, call us a partner with them, and we are going to have very soon, in, the, in, in, in this very town, a regional consultation on this uh, for the Europe, for Europe region. An important program that covers small countries, such as Malta, which is related to OER, is the virtual university for the small states of the Commonwealth. And uh, normally Commonwealth defines a small state as one with a, whose total population size is less than two millions. And 32 out of 53 member countries belong to this category. And many of them cannot afford to build their own universities. I mean, Malta can, but there are many other countries which cannot. So we try to help them create a network of uh, uh, teaching systems and we exchange material across them. We also make them available as open educational resources. This program launched in 2002 is now coming into some level of uh, success. And some of these learning modules which are available as OERs are very widely used across these countries, especially in the Pacific. Uh, now, that has also led us to talk about digital education, the topic of this whole conference. And we are looking at uh, digital education. In, in fact, this was an idea that Sandra mentioned. We looked at the fact that not only higher education at secondary education level as well, we need to promote leadership in digital education. And uh, there are new, new documents available which I would invite you to consult. Now, one of the challenges with OER, as I mentioned, was access. You know, like uh, Fiji is a country with 360 islands. Many are so remote that uh, no fiber ever reaches and uh, electricity doesn't even exist. Grid electricity doesn't even exist there. So how do they access open educational resources like Khan Academy? So we, we sort of built an experimental server based on mini PC that China has marketed 85 million of them for entertainment. We repurposed it for education. Now this small server here allows you with this power pack, allows you to access several thousand videos of Khan Academy, the entire Wikipedia. And it can be here in the middle of literally nowhere as you can see with these children or with the women, village women in parts of India. So this is now, we are trying to prove to governments that don't worry about access as a fundamental issue in open educational resource. It's getting solved, and totally new innovations are now available. And we have also worked with a culturally a very, very sensitive region in Pakistan, which is close to Afghanistan border, where, you know, uh, Taliban is active, where internet is simply not allowed by government in that area. We were able to deliver Khan Academy kind of uh, OERs to them as well. So now we are reaching, out, I'm almost reaching the end of my presentation. So once again, you know, looking at today's concern of digital education from the point of view of the developing part of Commonwealth. You know, we believe there is a double helix, I mean, you know, uh, which uh, two strands of which are employability and education. From the point of view of a policymaker in a typical developing country, the Commonwealth, they cannot be separated. They will always live together. So if education doesn't lead to employability and employment doesn't promote education, uh, either of them is useless. And this is, we believe, one challenge that is sort of uh, becoming globally uh, visible to everyone, namely the very changing nature of employment itself. I mean, we, you, can, you can feel it much more in North America and Europe than in other countries. But the fact is that in areas like agriculture, this has already happened. Fundamental changes in employment have started to occur. And we also believe that the biggest change has occurred at the level of learner. More than, that's something we've all been referring to, especially people who are school who are school children, we know that learners have changed fundamentally. And therefore, policymakers now say, you know, they're facing this challenge of three S's, that skills must be built at scale and at great speed. I mean, they, they say there is really no time to wait. I mean, debates are not important. These, these jobs have to be done. 
So from this point of view, we have been looking at MOOCs essentially from that point of view, not from the point of view of higher education, quality assurance alone. Those are all important. But we are saying that from a purely developing country point of view, MOOCs present a very different opportunity as well as a challenge. And uh, working with UNESCO uh, and uh, drafted by Darko Janssen from EADTU, uh, Carl and UNESCO brought out this book called Making Sense of MOOCs, whose primary conclusion is that don't link MOOCs only with higher education. It presents totally new opportunities for skills development, employability, etc. And uh, we call it MOOC for development to make it even uh, clearer. We call our own paradigm MOOC for development. And uh, our suggestion to policymakers is that if you find entering Coursera, EDX, FutureLearn very difficult because there are entry barriers, don't worry, come to us. We'll help you incubate your own MOOCs. I mean, try and start out a MOOC. And in fact, a number of people have gone through this incubation system. And our last one to go through was uh, Nigeria. In fact, Athabasca is now using this system to try out a new course. And very soon, Malta would be uh, with us as well. The idea here is a lot of faculty capacity building can be taken care of in this kind of an incubatory mode. And a lot of people are interested because it's also for many of them their introduction to online learning and to OERs. And now we are reaching almost the end of this. You know, I was, I was personally involved in teaching a MOOC. There were five MOOCs together which ran, very tough ones. I mean, I don't know, some of my colleagues made them extremely difficult. One was on geographic information systems in route management, very focused. So now, five courses, some students did all five and came out on real top, I mean, across the world. So we interviewed some of them. And it turned out that MOOCs are free to us, but not to them, because they spend a lot of money on bandwidth. And in fact, one parent complained to me that uh, because of my son, I lost one-tenth of my annual income because I invested it in buying bandwidth for him. So we now thought that maybe we should have a change. I mean, we should sort of think of MOOCs delivery as taking place, not in the web space, but more in the messaging space. Because as you can see from this, this is the latest uh, data from business intelligence. Uh, business insider intelligence, what it shows is that messaging applications have already overtaken social networking globally. And in other words, companies like WeChat, which is a Chinese company, uh, Messenger, which is a US company, and Viber have far overtaken uh, the social media. And in fact, this trend is rapidly increasing. Therefore, now we are in the process of talking to our partners about redeveloping the MOOC management system, learning management systems, to make them primarily messaging systems so that people can use their simple phones to interact with each other because we all understood that the, one of the core activities in MOOC is social, socializing and social interaction. And therefore, a lot of rebuilding needs to be done. And this will make digital education fundamentally different because we will suddenly have hundreds of millions of new people coming into this area from the developing countries. And your own understanding, this I'm quoting Sir John Daniel, who was president of Calm, that he always used to say that the most, most widely used innovation in education as we understand it is the blackboard. I mean, you can see here Einstein using it, and large part of developing part of Commonwealth still uses blackboard as the most fundamental innovation that's also accessible to them. And uh, there is a lot of change that is necessary. In fact, I'm quoting here a slightly complex slide from MIT, uh, which published a nice report. And uh, where they realized, where they point out that if you were to bring learner at the center, with due respect to teachers, if you bring learner at the center, a lot of technology needs to be changed. A lot of new technology development must take place. In fact, they say it will also lead to a new practice called the practice of a learning engineer. In fact, uh, when I spoke about this with Sir John Daniel, he said back in the 70s in Britain, there was talk of education engineering that went nowhere. I said, no, this is going to go somewhere because the need is now real. Education engineering may have looked fancy item, but learning engineering doesn't. So we may all have to think of digital education supported by the practice of learning engineering uh, in, in the very near future. So all these ideas we want to explore through the new center, uh, Commonwealth Center for Connected Learning, which is being set up by the government of Malta. Uh, where we participate in it. It's primarily a Malta center, but Malta will make it commonwealth-wide, as well as accessible to the European Union. So we would like you all to take active part in this, which should emerge as a major think tank, as well as as a technical advisory group. 
So I want to thank you for the time you have given me. Uh, the organizers, I don't know if there's anyone from among the organizing group here. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice presentation to give us an overview of Commonwealth work. For example, I was not so much acquainted with it. But uh, one thing tackled me, uh, presentation of MOOCs to development countries. So um, I don't know how much experience you have so far, but do you think that learners who in developing countries who will take MOOCs will be able to follow and finish them? Because um, I don't want to say anything bad, but do they have the skills to focus on learning, to be a patient, to follow all the tasks and to come to the end? So do you expect the, the high ratio of participants finishing the MOOCs or maybe not? Thank you. That's a very, very important question. You know, there are, I make a distinction between uh, MOOCs as they are offered by the big institutions yeah. as well as MOOCs, which we call MOOCs for development. In the area of General MOOCs, broadly speaking, the completion rates, for example, EDX has published, just published four-year data from 2012 to 16, and you'll find that the completion rates of people who have declared their country is not as bad as we think it could be. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in, in fact, when you find that in the old-style MOOCs where we had 100,000 people plus registration and 8% completion levels, those proportions obtain even when you primarily see uh, developing country students. So they do stay through. In fact, there is a very detailed analysis to show how, in fact, some of them stay through better than people from developing countries as well. That was a study published also by MIT a couple of years back, or MIT-based researchers. Now, my own experience working with about 77,000 learners in the last three years is that the completion rates, the engagement rates remain about 66%. Completion rates are very high because, in other words, if they want to come to a MOOC, there is already a very high level of motivation. So all you need to ensure is that you are delivering quality. Then people stay through. So that, in fact, that's why I said there are people who manage to complete five MOOCs, very demanding MOOCs, simultaneously at one go and came out on very top. So the, it, these are not just super performers. There were many such. Thank you. Can you yep. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Um, at, at Cyprus and Malta and the United Kingdom are the only members of the EU, and at the same time members of Commonwealth, I would say that it's really amazing how far uh, the educational support from from uh, uh, COL is for the um, countries. And I would like to say that it's not only this uh, uh, support for education. I, I have to say that. Uh, Commonwealth usually give scholarships to people, to young generations to study. So this, I, I feel like uh, um, this is an extension of the uh, offers of uh, Commonwealth to <coughs> young people. Thank you. Unfortunately, that program funded largely by the British government is over now. <laughs> and uh, we are also looking at the fact that a major political development like Brexit Give special edge, in my view, to countries like Cyprus and Malta because you are you are members of both the European Union as well as the Commonwealth. So it's going to give you, in, in our understanding, special advantages. So thank you. For are there any other points that you, as participants, want to make that none of the presenters cover? Something that you think is very important. Anything from you? Okay, so I'm glad we were able to uh, finish well in time. Do you have a point? Yes, sir. You want to invite everyone to study again? Of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably I can just correct my colleague Cable. That's not enough, I think. So, thank you. I wanted to correct probably my colleague and friend Cable from the morning session that the second World Congress on Open Educational Resources will take place really in Slovenia and Ljubljana, but not from the 28th to the 30th. Uh, it will be exactly from the 18th until the 20th of September next year. And we will promote it and, and 
as, as uh, possible as it will be. Uh, a website is already on. We will announce it during the sessions. So all of you most welcome to see you in September in Slovenia. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.